What I have to say today <laughs> may be a bit uh, critical, in fact, very critical. But there's a lot of light, there's a lot of darkness. And so here we go. And on top of that, I have forgotten my reading glasses, so my notes are totally useless to me right now. <laughs> so here I go. <clears throat> I was approached by, uh, I was, um, communication was sent to me by members of the Wildlife Society, registered members of the Wildlife Society, to the effect that science had relatively little merit in uh, the management of wildlife, that uh, courses in biology were a waste of time for students, that uh, the notion of evolution should be totally abandoned with, and uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that the, the society itself, wildlife society, should not endorse anything uh, what the ornithological society had endorsed, namely uh, the concept of evolution. Uh, so there were students being counseled at universities not to take courses in biology, as they would add nothing to the bag of the hunter. There would be no addition of bucks or ducks to the bag limits itself. This was a useless enterprise. Uh, three of us began to correspond uh, on this, and we were uh, very quickly told by the president of the Wildlife Society to quit in no uncertain terms because it was tearing apart the Wildlife Society. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the critics actually had a point, and the point is that wildlife uh, management has a very, very long history, and it has had times of great, great excellence in management, and literally hundreds of years before we knew the word science as such, before Charles Darwin was born. So if we go back into Europe, Central Europe, of about the 16th, 15th, 16th centuries, we find an enterprise that was quite, quite unique, and the results of which to this day are preserved are quite startling. At that time, um, well, to give you a little uh, idea, in the 1880s, Reisfeld, von Reisfeld, one of the great uh, originators of modern Central European conception about hunting on Central Roads, that the red deer today are quite small in comparison to those of the Middle Ages because they are excluded from the best lands in the valley bottoms that are mainly on mountains which are less fertile. And so the habitat reflects the tilt and the body size of these individuals and so the red deer of Germany in the 1880s were small compared to the red deer of the medieval time periods. And that's true. Because in the medieval time periods, those red deer were cherished beyond belief, and it was, in fact, the valley bottoms that they were exploiting. It was also a very different countryside in those days. This was a time when a knight could ride anywhere in Europe uh, without getting off his horse, because his head would never strike a branch of a tree. And the reason was that uh, you had a culture at that time of mother trees which were producing acorns and um, uh, beech nuts and so on. And these beech nuts and acorns were greatly, greatly valued because they formed the basis of the pig um, um, fattening system that was in place uh, so that uh, monasteries and uh, the landlords itself rented out <coughs> The, uh, these forests to pig herders and so that bacon and um, hams and so on were produced on that uh, basis. They were of course great, uh, excellent hams and if you would like to know what they taste like you have to go to Spain today because in Spain they still have that tradition of putting pigs out into the forests with uh, acorns. It's very expensive by the way, I'll be heading in three weeks to Spain and probably the first dish that I'll be ordering will be a a plate about thirty dollars worth of these magnificent cuts from the hands of these boars that are on must. Uh, this is a tradition that goes back millennia. When you taste that, you're tasting something that, you, 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 that Caesar tasted or Hannibal tasted in years gone by. It collapsed incidentally when the potato was introduced, because the potato was so much more reliable as a uh, food for fattening pigs. The mother trees were cut down, modern forestry came into being. But I'm going back to the time when that was not the case, when in fact the mother trees were covering the landscape entirely. And uh, because of the mother trees effect, you had a large amount of sunlight coming down on the forest floors, and you had wildlife that is an abundance of wildlife, but also the quality that is almost beyond belief. 
But this quality was not there by accident. It was very much there by design. And whatever the motives, and whatever they are, uh, we would condemn them or eulogize them, the point is the rulers of the land were very, very keenly interested in the high quality of red deer, the trophies of which they exchanged as princely gifts amongst themselves, the trophies of which they put into special castles which they built, uh, such as the Moritzburg in Germany, I just visited that. Uh, the walls, the uh, ceilings are about three times the height of this, and they're covered with these trophies from these centuries gone by. And to give you a little idea about the size of the red deer that were being harvested at that time point. Now, I have written a book about the, the deer of the world, and one of the things that I did, of course, was I was interested in taxonomy of um, elk, and I collected, no, collected skulls, but also went around about measuring skulls, and antlers, and so on and so forth. And I was interested in the antler mass that our elk generate. Now, you are probably aware that we rate the elk as the giant of the red deer family. And this giant of the red deer family, if you manage to get a set of antlers that weigh more than 15 kilograms, you're in heaven. The heaviest that I've ever, ever, um, well, it wasn't weight. Uh, what I had was a cast antler. And if that cast antler duplicated and you added a skull to it, the uh, weight would have approached 17 kilograms. In Moritzburg, the biggest stag hanging on the wall is 19.1 kilogram. These animals <coughs> were, we have excellent records on these because the kings, the royalty, kept individuals which were measuring the weight, so we have the weights of the animals, but they were also measuring the fat content of the animals. And they showed you how thick a layer of fat there was on the chest or on the back of these animals itself. It's about like this. And what was the weight? Uh, the weight was every bit as high as the biggest elk that I've ever weighed. The biggest elk I've ever weighed was 1,200 pounds. It was a lean bull in uh, uh, <coughs> Elk and the National Park. Yeah. So we had here a gigantic deer. But the point of the matter is, these giants were not there by accident. They were there by design. They were there by management. They were there by a very, very sophisticated management. The people knew exactly how to grow these enormous stags, and we've only caught up to it in the 20th century how we do it. And it was based on a profession, and it took six years to master that profession before you became then a, a hunter itself. Tremendous <coughs> understanding of how to handle dogs, for instance. Yeah. Tremendous understanding of how to care for individual stags in such a fashion that they could maximize antler growth. I'll just give you an example. A stag that is in the last, in the, uh, is growing antlers, is ferociously hungry. Ferociously hungry. And he will switch and move away from an area the moment the quality of the food decreases. Now, the nobility is watching with great concern and discussing uh, at court individual stags, which foresters have to look after. Yeah. Now, if that stag moves and goes a few miles elsewhere, it may be lost from sight. It may disappear. It may cross a boundary to somewhere else, which is a no-no. So the net result was that the foresters had to know, make absolutely sure that the stag during the growth of these antlers had access to the best quality of food, and that meant the fields of the peasants. Peasants could not interfere with the stags. If they did, it was all to them. There was a damn good reason why in 1523 there was a massive peasant revolution in Germany. And the demands of the peasants were very similar to that of the peasants in the French Revolution, by the way. But this is an aside. But the point of the matter is they recorded their information. They recorded their understanding. And so there are encyclopedias available. And this is now knowledge hundreds of years before science. Now, this encyclopedia, one of them is, um, that I have is from 1717, for instance. And to give you a little hint at the quality 
of that information that is there. Um, <clears throat> Todd Fleming discusses wolves uh, quite extensively. This is an encyclopedia written in honor of the king of uh, Poland. And so he describes, first of all, how to make distinguish between the tracks of a male and a female wolf. Do you know that? Have you found anywhere in English, in English literature, uh, a description how to distinguish between the, the tracks of a male and female wolf? If you do, then let me know, please. <laughs> they go on. He goes on to describe how to distinguish between the tracks of a wolf that is suffering from rabies, as opposed to a wolf that is uh, healthy. Can you find me anywhere a reference to uh, describe that? The point of the matter is these, this material was put down by men as good as we are. Bright men, good men, and with deep understanding of what they were. I have cited Fleming in my own book on Deer of the World because he describes in exquisite detail and excellence the behavior of the fallow deer during the rocking season. So the point is there was knowledge available uh, in these early days. Now the idea of science uh, coming into wildlife management in modern times has been referred to as the Roosevelt Doctrine to the president, ex-president Theodore Roosevelt, who was not a scientist himself but was an excellent observer, an excellent author, and I've cited him also quite extensively in certain things about elk that cannot be seen today, such as what happens when you chase elk for days on days on days on end on horseback. Uh, the reason was is this. Elk, uh, besides the caribou, are the two species of deer which are most highly evolved in running. They have the body shape uh, of an exquisite high-speed runner of endurance. The only deer that was superior as a runner to our elk or the caribou was the extinct Irish elk of these enormous antlers fame. It had an enormous chest with an enormous lung heart capacity. It was a high speed uh, runner. Etc. Now I'm mentioning this because Teddy Roosevelt did hunt elk on horseback and describes it cannot be done today. There's fences all over the West. Elk cannot move uh, as they once did over very, very long distances. But at any rate, the Roosevelt Doctrine, and Uncle Leopold brought it in, and it's part and parcel of the North American model as it, in fact, uh, should be. Now, the, I'm going to be switching to the, uh, at this point to uh, some of the threats for our North American model. And amongst these, ladies and gentlemen, I would think one of the foremost right now is chronic wasting disease. Uh, I warned about chronic wasting disease publicly for the first time in a book in 1991. Uh, it is about the um, future of elk in a popular book that I wrote, Elk Country. It's a nasty disease, very, very nasty, already known then to be a very nasty disease. I subsequently wrote a review of that disease and its sister diseases and published it in 1995 in this book, by the way. I don't challenge anybody to find fault with that uh, description. I am now, 27 years later, the chief author of this publication, Chronic Wasting Disease, the challenge of chronic wasting disease insidious and dire. 27 years. <coughs> well, how far have we moved in doing anything about it? How far have we moved? What good has been my work <coughs> as a scientist along that line? How much, how, what good will be my work be in the future? Because what we have to do right now is we, have to, we are in a dire state, we have to contain the disease. We can have to contain it badly. And the reason is this, it's spreading. And worst of all, the infectious agent is spreading and it is not destructible so far. We don't know how to destroy it. 
And now we're discovering preliminary works, but there it is. It's being taken up by plants. And these plants will kill mice and rats in laboratories. Okay? There are 20 uh, some ranches right now in Saskatchewan which are in total quarantine because of uh, being contaminated with chronic wasting disease. We are now seeing for the first time that agriculture is starting to get worried about this. What will happen if this bloody disease infects our crops? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I can make you a prediction. It's not that far away from today that we may see that agriculture will uh, ask that there be no deer or elk on any land that produces crops. So be prepared for it. <clears throat> and so the question that we have, we've known about this disease. It's been gotten progressively worse. Oh yes, it's been very, very clever uh, moves on the part of game farmers against that. Yeah. But here we are sitting, very, very close to a national crisis. The science was clear from the outset. And the only thing that I ever got out of that was the threat to my life and to that of my wife as part of that. So, yes, we are celebrating science and scholarship and knowledge and so on as part of our model. But for God's sake, we've got to be able to act on it. And now I'm going to go into another disaster. Absolute disaster. <clears throat> from the perspective of science, scholarship, <laughs> and conservation. And this is the international attempts, the global attempts right now, to reintroduce wolves into the countryside. I am getting two steady streams into my uh, of emails, one from the German side, and I wish, I wish you could read German, and the other one from the West uh, itself. Now, what has happened, by and large, is that we've had a movement afoot to rewild, rewild, or however you want to pronounce it, uh, our land. And the idea is that you will return the uh, missing ecological pieces to the landscape itself, and that we will then have a regime where nature knows best, and we shall live in some sort of a nirvana uh, <laughs> ever after. The Uh, well, the, the fiasco in this is not only that when you introduce wolves into settled landscapes that you cause an enormous amount of destruction. Uh, the, the interesting part right now is to watch in Germany, which has a total prohibition on any killing of wolves, and the wolves are increasing at in 30% a year right now. And the, um, uh, it's, they're running right on predictions, incidentally, because there is so much information available on wolves that has been ignored, and the information is the historical information uh, about wolves. But anyway, we'll get to uh, the point that the environmental community is set and gung-ho on having wolves back into the countryside. Well, the first of the so-called surprises is, of course, the effects that it has, because it will, in Europe, for instance, uh, is, it will eliminate sheep uh, farming completely. Beautiful stuff comes out of France uh, and uh, Switzerland and, uh, and Germany, films, for instance, yeah. Um, massive killings are taking place. The best one so far is in one night, over 450 dead sheep were well, hold back. <coughs> and of course, it's being pointed out that if you destroy sheep farming, uh, in much of the landscape in particularly France and southern France, what are you going to get? You're going to have a regrowth of the Mediterranean vegetation, right? The meadows are going to be lost. And then you're going to have fires like you have in California. As a consequence, yeah? Thank you. You have in Europe, Central Europe, a system of canals 
that runs. And these canals are being maintained, the, uh, the banks are being maintained by uh, very, very uh, traditional and long-term, very knowledgeable sheep grazing. You know? We're going to take the sheep away because they can't exist with the wolves on. What's going to happen? Everything's still in the crop, yeah? What are you going to do then? Well, uh, the, um, one of the differences between American and European red deer, uh, well, <coughs> became, it's becoming quite obvious right now, uh, red deer in Saxony have now abandoned the forest. They're forming large congregations of agricultural land, great big herds of the animals, trying to avoid wolves, of course. Yeah. So, very large amount of damage to the landscape, understandably so. Well, of course, these are Europeans, so they haven't done what our American deer do. They go right away to cities. <coughs> oh, that's why the reason why you have deer in your cities, for God's sake. They're trying to escape predation. What else? We've done that in national parks ever since I've been studying national parks. I've been doing it around here. Forty years ago, we didn't have it. Well, there was a bloody good reason why we didn't have it. But now you do. So, uh, the point of the matter is that you can see the instruction coming. And, of course, there comes a point when the wolf becomes dangerous to people. And um, uh, the, um, uh, when I came to uh, Vancouver Island, uh, we had all of a sudden an influx of a wolf um, pack. And uh, by God, I started learning rather, rather rapidly uh, what was going on. One of the things that I noticed was that these wolves were acting very differently from what I knew from wolves on the mainland. I've observed them for years on the mainland. Uh, they were starting to observe us. Wolves don't, don't normally do that. They don't sit down on the butt and observe human beings. Yeah. Uh, but our wolves here on the island were starting to do that. And they did even more than that, they came and approached, and the closest I've had is from here to you, where they've come and just, want, uh, by the way, I didn't want to shoot him, uh, I wanted to study this beast. He was a wolf that lived, incidentally, he was no danger to anybody. My neighbors said, yeah, we'll let him live. But the point is, he was investigating. Now, wolves are extremely good, um, visual observers and visual learners. And we know that from my friends which have raised wolves uh, for many, many decades. Uh, such, for instance, uh, they will, wolves will sit and watch how you uh, lock doors and they will find ways of opening them. Yeah. Dogs can do that. Dogs and wolves are quite different in many, many regards. Very different, in fact. But the point is they're very excellent learners. Well, uh, I put everything together, and of course what it meant was that uh, we were being examined as an alternative to prey, because they were observing, they were observing, they observed, and then finally they will try to make a uh, preliminary attack on you, clumsy at first, and then comes a real attack. Because this is how they explore well, uh, a new prey, when they are short of prey. And of course, on Vancouver Island, we are short of prey. The wolves that I had were tiny specimens. The biggest I've weighed was 85 pounds, and that was a giant. <coughs> the biggest that I have not weighed, uh, the, which I saw in the Spazizi when I was a young man, were unbelievable. I couldn't lift the darn thing to skin it, for God's sake. Yeah. They were as big as any of white tail buck that I've ever killed. Gigantic wolves at that time, for good reason. But anyway, what I was trying to drive at is, uh, on the 27th of September in uh, 05, in Madison, Wisconsin, I was giving the honor of giving a keynote address on animal behavior. And I spoke at that time of what I had observed in Bolton and said, this I think is how they target a new prey. <laughs> what I didn't know was, six years before that, colleagues studying coyotes in California had developed an understanding and had seen exactly the same thing that coyotes were doing when they were targeting children in urban parks. So we had, at that point, an understanding that coyotes are interested in eating human beings, little human beings. And the way they approach it is exactly the same as what I was observing uh, on Vancouver Island. And by the way, which is exactly the same thing with, in retrospect, what's happening when um, Kenton Carnegie was killed by wolves in Saskatchewan. That was a student, a very brilliant young man. He was on scholarship. He was in a northern camp in order to um, 
observed some mining operations. He was on his way to Saudi Arabia uh, on that uh, same scholarship. He was a vegetarian. He was an environmentalist. <laughs> and he obviously believed the uh, uh, myth that wolves are harmless. Uh, there were wolves um, feeding on garbage. They had started feeding on garbage, but uh, they, these wolves could not be killed by uh, Saskatchewan laws. And so the wolves habituated. They evaded the garbage trucks and tore apart the uh, bags of garbage as soon as they were uh, heaved off. On the 4th of November 05, they approached uh, very, very aggressively two young men. One was a um, uh, pilot. Uh, quite a well-known pilot, as a matter of fact, bush pilot, and the other one was a geophysicist. They had gone out on the uh, airfield to look at an old aircraft that had been uh, standing there for some time. The, these two wolves tried to cut them off to return, but these young men uh, got uh, stepped into the swamp, and you know yourself in the northern swamps, you can grab hold of the uh, dead uh, <coughs> spruce trees, the little spruce trees, pull them out so they had a club, and they warded off these two wolves, took photos of them, uh, bragged about them, and uh, uh, four days later, Kenton Carnegie was killed by these wolves. The, uh, <clears throat> one of the interesting uh, things about that, for me at least interesting, was that I said, uh, I was asked by the family to investigate the killing, which I did, and wrote a report on that. And uh, I was interviewed on this a number of occasions, and one of the points that I made in these interviews to the CBC to the uh, National Post, to a newspaper, and uh, was that had Kent Carnegie landed in British Columbia, he would have been alive and well. Because the laws of British Columbia and Saskatchewan differ dramatically on how you treat wolves. We uh, hunt wolves. I am a uh, carrier of hunting license. I can have three wolves on my uh, ticket. Any one of you can shoot one at least in your country. The point being that with that system in place, any wolf that becomes interested in human beings is dead. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what you don't want because an a wolf that has become interested in you has something. This is not a natural. This is not a, a wolf you want to retain under any circumstance because eventually, 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 he will come down and do damage to your uh, sheep, to your uh, dogs, or whatever it is. Or, as in one case, my one wolf chased my wife back into my own home on Vancouver Island. <coughs> the the point that I made was that the legislation in Saskatchewan was in part responsible for the death of Kenton Carnegie as well as for some of the subsequent attacks that have happened. The legislation in Saskatchewan is such that only tra uh, trappers with a uh, trapping territory can kill a wolf. Everything else has to go under very special conditions. So the wolves that are habituating to human beings on garbage are uh, safe and therefore can do what they did to Kent Carnegie or uh, there are some few other attacks for, which have been beaten back, uh, of course. <clears throat> so I'm asking you, you, why did the CBC and the National Post not report on that? <coughs> why did they not report that the legislation in Saskatchewan was such that it encouraged wolf attacks on people. Ultimately. I'm asking you this. It is information. It is something that is based on science. On the work of colleagues in California, as I said, and on, and on others in the meantime. And yet we cannot get this into the newspapers. Now, the um, idea of putting wolves into settled landscapes is that these wolves will uh, propagate and that we shall have done something to conserve wolves as a species. You're absolutely wrong. What you have done by putting wolves into settled landscapes is to condemn the wolves to genetic extinction by hybridization. In other words, if you want to destroy wolves completely and utterly, put them into settled landscapes and let dogs and coyotes take care of the rest, okay? Because that's exactly what's happening. This is not theory. This is not theory. This is practice. This is, this is ongoing right now in the eastern uh, United States and Canada. It's called the coy wolf. The coy wolf is 60% wolf, 30% coyote, 10% dog. 
and it's not a species, a Darwinian species, it's not a species at all, it's a human artifact. Totally worthless. The thing that is worthwhile, truly worth it, is a little coyote. That's, a Canadian, that's an American species that evolved on this continent under extremely <coughs> severe predation conditions. It is a unique American wolf. And it is right now going down the drain uh, because no coyote population tested has been without dog genes already. <laughs> but when you put wolves into settled landscapes, you put them into contact with coyotes and with dogs. And now it's only a matter of time before they all turn into feral dogs. Here in North America or in Europe, where this is going on. And there's tremendous denial about that from the environmental community. So again, I'm asking you, where is the respect for the science and knowledge and scholarship? Because you are not conserving wolves by conserving hybrids. Oh, there is this idea that, oh yeah, but the hybrids carry uh, wolf genes and we're conserving wolf genes. But ladies and gentlemen, it so happens that with this wonderful uh, study in molecular biology, we're discovering that whales and pigs are very closely related. <laughs> in fact, whales are marine-going hippopigs. <laughs> the same basic genetics as in pigs and hippos will, with different epigenetic mechanisms, generate completely different organisms. Completely different organisms. And you do nothing to conserve whales by protecting pigs. <laughs> Well, the same uh, studies show that we and chimpanzees are something like 99% alike in our basic genetics. But you're not a chimpanzee. By a long, long, long shot. Because the epigenetics is different. And it's the same thing with hybridization with dogs and wolves. The, the hybrids are, well, first of all, they're far from the father's competent. One of the uh, differences, significant differences, is that um, Dogs do not feed their babies by regurgitating food, and wolves do. So the way that uh, the wolves, the dog genes get introduced into wolf populations is by young female <coughs> wolves going out searching for a mate at the height of the time and finding dogs and doing, by the way, they're kicked out, of course, these from the, the pack, and uh, <coughs> because there will only be one, a breeder in the pack that is the dominant female, the dominant mother. If the young one are kicked out and they become into heat, they will search out the dog. And they will raise uh, uh, hybrids. The first pack of wolves that I was familiar with in, on Vancouver Island it came in the summer of 99 and we killed the last one of May 12, 03. Uh, they were hybrids. I've looked at the skulls, I have three skulls, four skulls, pardon me, and they show dog characteristics. So the uh, uh, Vancouver Island being a separate subspecies, which is complete bullshit. I mean, it gets complete. <laughs> That's where you get some of the differences from. They're already hybridizing. So what we have right now is the wonderful green and environmental community hell-bent on destroying the bull. Now, listen to some of the ironies behind it. What did we do in the past? Oh, in the bad old times, remember? Which we quit in 1964. It was the last time we poisoned wolves, right? From the air. With poisoned meat. Well, we had in those days, the 1950s, 1960s, and before that, of course, we had a trapping community on the land. This was a time before skidoos, etc., did the hard work. It was when dog teams were on the land, and the dog sleds and wolves don't get along. So you had a system of occupation of the land in which the wolves were being reduced. Well, of course, we also didn't tolerate wolves on settled landscapes, that is, in, around ranches and farms. And we had, I think it was nine conservation officers at one point, which were dedicated to the control of predators uh, here. Well, what, you, what we had as a result of that was wolves were segregated 
away from settled landscapes. And they were being uh, controlled to quite an extent, which is very uh, necessary with wolves, 30% increase per year, yes. And because they were living a wonderful life because of the abundance of prey, these wolves were gigantic. And I, as a young zoologist, I experienced those wolves, gigantic wolves. Yeah. And these gigantic wolves would never breed with a little coyote to begin with. They would eat them as soon as they could. So what we had done there, by the circumstances, we had maintained wolves genetically clean and pure in our northern landscapes. And now we've broken that system. Now we're putting the wolves back with the coyotes and therefore in pure in danger of, to, of extinction, genetic extinction as such. So we had this system, brutal as it was, but it maintained the wolf as a pure species. Now, <clears throat> I was, as a young man, very much involved in setting up ecological reserves. I was very much involved in the Yukon National Park creation and so on and so forth. And right now I'm cringing at the very thought of preservation. I'm cringing because I'll give you this little statistics. 417 national parks in the United States, 6,000 invasive species. 6,000 invasive species have a permanent home in national parks. Thank you. Well, a colleague who was of a different opinion in California is a piece of land, and uh, he wanted to get rid of the invasives, amongst other things, and so on and so forth. He started out with about 60 native species of plants. Now, with burning, scarifying, and selective removal of plants, he's up to 350 species of, of plants. He makes sure that everybody who comes in takes off their shoes so they don't bring any seeds from the outside. What he has been recreating is the landscape that native people had created uh, at the time when the Spaniards had appeared, because <clears throat> To most of uh, us, it is not really well known that when, uh, well, when white people came to this continent, they were coming basically to a highly civilized continent. Civilized in the sense that it was a continent that was uh, providing services for human beings, deliberately and with great, great skill. Uh, the continent was occupied about 12,000 or between 14,000 and 12,000 years ago, the megafauna was exterminated. And uh, because of the uh, extermination of the megafauna, you had, of course, tremendous growth of vegetation, so you had to learn how to burn it in order to survive. But this was then extended furthermore into a very, very skillful knowledge about how to burn, and that in turn became the basis of an extremely highly sophisticated knowledge of horticulture that was dominating this continent. Now, when explorers first came to this continent, they were blind. They didn't see the fact that the eastern hardwood forest was not a natural forest, but was a nut garden, for instance, yeah. And one gentleman who made this point very beautifully, uh, Edgar Anderson, in his book, Man, Plants, and Life, described how a Harvard-educated botanist was collecting plants in a native garden in Central America and thought he was in the wilderness. Well, if that is the case with our Harvard-educated uh, individuals, what do you expect from the poor individuals that came from Europe stepping on this land and not recognizing that this land was under very close human control? Again, knowledge coming to play. So, uh, we have a large amount of land that we set aside and we think we're doing something by habitat protection by doing nothing but wrong. What we have to learn is to the old, old lesson that was learned here 12,000 years ago, and that is how to take that land and to manage it for biodiversity and to get away from this protectionism that we have. We cannot afford in the long term to take one iconic species like the grizzly bear, praise it into heaven, protect it, or the wolf, or whatever, but we, in a system of conservation, we have to do as has been done in the past, namely at looking at all the elements, and we must not believe that we are doing us or anybody a great favor by sitting down, looking at a piece of landscape, folding our arms, doing nothing about it, and thinking this is management. It's not. 
we have to have the courage to do some active management. Because right now on our protected uh, national parks, caribou are going extinct because we do not dare interfere with predators, for instance. Yeah? But we have to. Uh, in case you're interested how old is predator control, and how 40,000 years. The wolves in Europe suffered their very first severe reduction in genetic bottleneck when human beings of our type, that is the modern human beings out of Africa, which came out of Africa about 60,000 years ago and then into Europe about 40,000 years ago. At 40,000 years they enter, and that's when you find the bottleneck of wolves. And that's the beginning of megafaunal extinction also in Europe as such. And the only place that I have found where wolves were eulogized, uh, there, no, there are a few places, <laughs> but one remarkable one is um, in Spain, not in Spain, in uh, Japan. The reason was wolves, uh, the uh, disarmed peasants, could not control the population of pigs or deer that were ravaging their land, their crops. They used wolves, they attracted wolves. They made wolves into gods, eulogized them. And this went all for hundreds of years till rabies came along. And rabbit wolves are something to behold. Truly something to behold. A rattlesnake on legs is minor compared to a rabbit wolves who comes around and uh, hits a good number of people. Because in former days, even a nip was a death sentence because nobody could survive that. So the Japanese exterminated the wolves by 1905 because of that. We know that indigenous communities do in, uh, protect wolves also at times, but there's good reason for that. Wol as, uh, wolves can keep down measles predators, which allow fish stocks and migratory water uh, fowl to recover very nicely. So there's reason for that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, We have a very, very mixed history when it comes to science, knowledge, and scholarship in wildlife conservation. And the reason I'm discussing this is it's my hope that we can go do a little bit better than we've done in the past. Thank you.